Let's look at document 16. In document 16, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. In education, in education, we typically believe that if we instruct people in facts and truth, you should see a, a diagram like building blocks there. Is that right? So if you look at facts and truth and somehow cover the two bottom boxes and just look at facts and truth, we typically have thought historically that if we teach people facts and truth, that would develop their beliefs and that would develop their values and that they would then exhibit godly behaviors. And then as education has processed things over the years, what they've done is come down and put more foundations under it and say, ah yes, there is there are facts and there are truths, but the attitudes toward those things are what determine your behaviors. Not just knowing the facts and truth, but the attitudes toward the facts and truth. Okay? And so for years we kind of worked on trying to have the right attitude toward the facts and truth so we could develop the right beliefs and values and behaviors. And then in more recent years, what we're hearing in education is uh, we need something else below that yet. We need a better foundation below that. And what they're saying is we need relationships, friendships. So you see what I did? I started with facts and truth and tried to build on that and then showed how that was a little bit faulty. And what we're doing now is saying, ah, we need more foundation underneath the facts and truth and we need more foundation underneath that too. And so when we look at the basic foundation here, relationships and friendships with other people, influence of parents, grandparents, teachers, role models, existential examples, that means examples that literally exist in time and space. Real people who breathe and are able to live. Examples of character, integrity, ideals, and behaviors. So not only do we need facts and truth, not only do we need the right attitudes toward them, we also need to see them lived out. We need to see them lived out by real people. And when we do that, we start believing them. And then we have the right attitudes. And then the facts and the truth make sense. And here's something I didn't think I would ever, it never occurred to me that this could happen, but as I worked with students for the last 25 years, what I've heard in the last five years is if somebody's got a problem and, and I'm saying, well, look, the Bible says this, more than once I'm having them say, I don't care what the Bible says. In fact, I was at a church speaking, a Mennonite church, just uh, this past year, and as I was greeting people at the door as they were leaving, uh, I had somebody bring this very thing to me. They said, did you ever run into a place where young people are telling you they don't care what the Bible says? And I said, yes, I am running into that. I said, where are you? This person was in education. Yes, we are. They said, what's going on? I said, well, what I think is going on is, uh, and then when I ask young people, you don't want to hear what the Bible says, what do you want to hear? And they look at me and they say, I want to see you live that. Okay? Do you know what I'm talking about? Relationships and friendships with people, the influence of parents, grandparents, teachers, role models, real life examples of character, integrity, ideals, behaviors. In other words, if I'm not a godly person, can I teach you facts and truth that are going to make sense to you? Probably, if I'd be a science teacher, it might work. Maybe if I'd be a math teacher, it might work. But teaching things like I teach, the Bible, and, and behaviors, that won't work. And so, particularly in our families, particularly in our churches, it's so very important that we have role models that are absolutely godly people of integrity and people whose lives are, are uh, living above wrong and sin and harm and problems. Is that always going to be possible? Nope. It's not always going to be possible. But there are people, and in my own life, I've had to select role models who were godly and helpful where they did not exist. My father was an excellent role model in some ways. In some other ways, he was a very poor role model. So what do I do? You know, as you become your age, you get to be 18, 20, 25 and older, you know, we have to have the wisdom and the courage to say, okay, you know, I had a good role model here, but in another place it was not a good role model, I have to seek a good role model. 
and then find that role model and follow it and then attempt in your life to be a role model for the people around you so that when they look at you they can see that you're a person of absolute integrity. Uh, God became human and became our example of how to live. So how did God do this? He became a human being. Jesus in the incarnation, there's our word again, carnal, okay, uh, in the incarnation he becomes flesh. Jesus, God, who's the Spirit, becomes flesh. Jesus was and is the example of what we should be. The scripture was written as a revelation of his life. He was a real man. He was masculine without expressing sexuality in sinful ways. Can you imagine Jesus ever doing anything immoral or improper? Can you even imagine that? No, we, I, I trust not. We cannot. And we see in his example, as we looked at the lady there, in John 4, did he treat her with respect? Totally, absolutely. And so, if he lived that way, then that's the call on my life. See, that's the call on my life to live that way also. Jesus lived in a difficult, dirty world. It could not have been fun living in first century Israel. Uh, all of the problems, all of the struggles they had. Uh, Jesus lived in a difficult world, but Jesus sheds light on how to live in this world. He is the light that illuminates our life and dispels the darkness. He tenderly, and notice here how he lived, he tenderly showed the woman at the well what a real man should be. But that's not the only thing he did. He excoriated the religious leaders with scathing words. It's kind of fun to use words sometimes. You know what excoriation means? If you ever pour acid on your hand, you will discover what excoriation means because it will eat your skin, okay? And he used eating words. He used biting words to talk to these people. And so excoriation literally means acid on the skin, okay? Acid that is literally going to eat away your skin. And he used words that were so harsh against these religious leaders. But he gently held little children. What I'm trying to show you in this is that Jesus is our example, and especially as men, men and women, but especially as men. We've got to live this way, okay? It's the call in our life. You know, you tenderly treat a woman in the way she should be treated. But when somebody does something wrong, I mean, he came down on them like merciless, right? Matthew 23, 8 times says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. What? Hypocrites, right? Those are pretty rough words. I mean, to say it one time is one thing. He says it eight times in a row. So Jesus is the example. He gently held little children and blessed them. Can you do that? You know, can those hands, those same hands that point to the sins of the Pharisees, hold a child? Uh, he taught men and women the way to the kingdom of God. He was a teacher. So he was gentle, he was kind, he was direct, he was a prophet, he was a teacher. He healed physical, emotional, spiritual sickness. I'm not very good at healing physical sicknesses, okay? But... I tried diligently to heal emotional and spiritual sicknesses in people's lives. And first of all, the call in my life is to live the way Jesus lived. Can I do that perfectly? No. Can I do it as well as possible? Yes, and so can you. We need to compare and contrast and conform our lives to his. We need to keep his commandments. Transactional <clears throat> and interpersonal theology are inextricably licked. Some playing with words here again. Uh, when you look at the way Jesus lived, then you know how you should live. When you look at the way Jesus lived, then you know how God wants things done. So when he encounters things that are wrong, he does something about it. So many times I'm talking to people and, let's see, what's the problem with the world? Men, especially passive men, but what's God's answer to the problems in the world? Godly men. When we are godly men, we live the way Jesus lived. You see something wrong, you do something about it. You don't just ignore it. You do it gently, you do it kindly, you do it appropriately, but you do it. That's what he did, okay? And that's the transactional part. There's a transaction. You see something, you respond appropriately. There's a problem, you deal with it, okay? And then the interpersonal part is the part where you have this relationship with God. So there's not only the relationship with God, but there's also the part that that relationship with God impacts the area of your life, and your body then does the things, takes the actions that it needs to take. 
So you cannot separate these things. And it takes a lot of courage to do things that are counter to what, what people think may be right. And of course, the religious leaders all thought they were right. And Jesus knew they were wrong, and he did something about it. Attitudes are created by relationships. Attitudes are created by relationships. Okay. Jesus wants a relationship with you, and that relationship will change your life as you pattern your life after his life. And that's the way disciples live. So was Jesus not able to sin, or was he able to not sin? Well, the answer is yes. Okay? <laughs> that's the answer I was looking for. The answer is yes. As God, he was not able to sin. As man, he was able to not sin. And so we can really not understand this. Uh, theologians come up with big words, and they call this the hypostatic union. You don't need to remember that, but uh, if you study theology, you'll get all kinds of big words here. The hypostatic union is the idea that together, in one human being, Jesus was God and humanity. And so... He was protected from sinning in his godness. Uh, and the passage for that is, is, is uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Right? Most people memorize this. Who being in form of God. Okay? Who is he? What is his form? This is Christ Jesus. His form, his morphe, is... God. And God can't sin. Who being in the form of God thought it ro not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he did not have to try to be God. Okay, listen closely. This is important. This is the Bible. Help us understand. He did not have to try to be God. Now suppose I told you my name is... Uh, Let's see, who should I pick on today? Uh, let's say I told you my name was uh, Derek, okay? And then you asked me, when is my birthday? And I'd say, um, yeah, I do have a birthday, uh, right? Well, what's your address? Uh, I'm not sure. You see how I'm grasping at being somebody I'm not? I'm trying to be somebody I'm not, and I don't know the answers to the questions. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't have to do that. He was God. He did not have to grasp at being God. Okay? That's who he was. But as we go on, but made himself of no reputation. In other words, and once again, that's a Greek word, uh, kenosis, ekenosan. It means to empty. When he comes to earth, he empties himself of what? He's still God, but he's not sitting on a throne of glory, is he? He's born in, a main, born in a stable, lying in a manger, walking the dusty streets, <clears throat> getting hungry, tired, <clears throat> and so on. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him, in other words, he's going to add something here, plus took upon him the form of a servant. So he, took, he takes upon himself the form of a servant. And in doing that, he is made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, his fashion, the way he appears, okay, equals what? He's a man. Okay. And so this passage is so full of helping us understand Jesus, okay, and who he is. He's God. He's a servant. He's a human being. None of us, to answer Derek's question, none of us can ever be that. <clears throat> but we can understand him as best we can. And then when we turn to Hebrews, we find, we find the words that we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, which means we do have a high priest who can be touched. Okay? So you add all this together, and you get the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord. He's the Christ. He lived here. Can he be touched with the feelings of your infirmities? If he was only God, could he be touched? You could say he doesn't understand. 
since he became man, what? He can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. His godness does not sin. He could not sin as God. But as a human being, he had the power to not sin. Why? Hebrews again tells us that he, that he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Jesus. Jesus suffered? Did Jesus suffer? And when he got to those places of suffering, he prayed, not my will, but God's will be done. He submitted himself to his Father. And so, yes, that's what we need to do. Can we do that? Psalm 119 says, Thy word is a, what? Lamp to my feet. Anybody ever walk in the dark with a lantern? Ever do that? I don't mean an electric, you know, million, whatever they call it, spotlight, okay? And those, lan those electric lanterns that make light everywhere. I'm talking about lan a lantern where you light the wick and it's got coal oil in it or something of that sort. It makes about a circle as big as you are when you hold it beside you. It gives you light for one more step. I almost never encounter anybody who doesn't know what to do in the next step. We want that lantern that shines way out there a mile down the road. You know, I don't know what to do. I wonder what my life's going to be five years from now. Well, it's good to think about that. But God will give you light for one more step. When you take that step, the lantern will give you light for another step. Okay. So if we can do what's right in the next 20 seconds, do what's right in the next minute, <clears throat> life is lived in seconds. Life is lived in minutes. Okay. Life isn't lived in decades. It's lived in moments. In document 17, I talk about the purpose of suffering. Uh, why does God allow us to suffer? Well, suffering is a part of life. Suffering is a normal part of being a Christian. Suffering is a part of humanity. Even if you're not a Christian, there will be suffering. So in a Christian's life, what is the purpose of suffering? I presented this at churches along the way over the years. And I think of most of the things I've ever presented this probably gets more attention from people than anything else. Uh, people seem to be able to, to resonate with suffering. And we're not going to spend a great deal of time on presenting it. I just want to go over the paper and see what questions or comments you have. You know, the question is always, what about suffering in human life? If God is a good God and God's true God, is there any way that, that he would allow the kinds of suffering we go through? Well, he does. He does it for many reasons. Well, let's take a look at some of these uh, reasons. First of all, so you can identify with Jesus Christ. And we already talked about Jesus having suffered. And he suffered intensely. Part of his suffering was for, for him to learn obedience. Now, it's hard for us to understand, but he was a human being. And uh, we could look at many different places. We could look in Luke when he was a baby and he grew up. And in his growth process, it says he grew in, in, in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So Jesus had to grow just like you had to grow. He grew in wisdom, which is mentally. He grew in stature, which is physically. He grew in favor with God, which is spiritually. He grew in favor with man, which is socially. So how can a God grow? Okay, but as a human being, he did. He was a little baby. Uh, and he grew, and he, he learned so many things. And, you know, sometimes we talk about the way uh, some of the New Testament Apocrypha talks about Jesus. And I know it's not really part of our lesson, but it just comes to my mind now. And the New Testament Apocrypha, some places says that Jesus worked with his dad in the carpenter shop, and when somebody cut a board too short, they gave it to Jesus, and he went, boom, and it fit, okay? And <laughs> they said... <laughs> 
this is apocryphal, okay? So, uh, and maybe when he was a little child, uh, one of the stories is that uh, he got upset with his playmates, so he turned them into goats. And their mothers got really upset, so he turned them back into children again. And so there are all these apocryphal stories about Jesus. And uh, there are more, but I'll stop with those two. So, <clears throat> but he did grow up just like we did. Did he ever do naughty things? Well, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. According to the apocryphal accounts, he did, of course. So are they true? Uh, they're not in the scripture. When the church had to decide which of these writings go in the Bible, they decided those do not belong in there. And so we don't read those typically. But Jesus did suffer. He was hungry. He was tired. Uh, he had to go aside and rest. He had boundaries in his life. He said, we need to go aside and rest a while. He'd get on a boat and go out in the, and on the sea. So why do we suffer? Part of the reason for our suffering is so we can identify with Jesus. He suffered. He was, he was abused in ways we can never be abused. I mean, the, his back was completely destroyed from whips. I mean, we think of getting whipped and you think about, you know, maybe a couple of welts. No, those whips tore the muscles off of his back. That has never happened. I don't think it's ever happened to you. Certainly never happened to me, you know. And then carrying the weight of the world. Sometimes I think I'm carrying the weight of the world, but I know I'm not, okay? So, but when we suffer, it links us to Jesus. It's also to eliminate sin in our life. Suffering is a way, uh, he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Do you ever notice when you're sick or when you may get hurt, uh, that all of a sudden it turns you to God? You start praying and you think, Oh, Lord, I want to get better, right? And suffering is a way of turning us toward God. Sometimes it turns people away from God, but it's supposed to turn us toward God. It's also an evidence of God in your life, the fact that God is working in your life. I remember when uh, there was a wedding of one of the nobles or a royal family in England, I think it was, and they, they talked about, well, before these people got married, uh, they had to check into the, the history of this person and make sure that this person was worthy of being part of the royal family. And, you know, the royal children have to go through all these training processes that other children don't have to go through. Well, the same thing is true of us. If you're a child of the king, you're going to be trained and disciplined in ways that the commoners aren't. You're going to be disciplined in a way, and, and, and there'll be some suffering in it in, part, in the the result of learning and the process of learning. And so it's a result of, of and an evidence of God in your life. He's not just going to allow you to live in an easy way. He's going to bring, he's going to bring tension and pressure and direction and, and guidance to pull you close to him. It's also a result of godly living. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It doesn't say some, it says all. And so when you have struggles, when you have problems, it can be a result of godly living. It's also to purify your life. Job says, when he tries me, I shall come forth as what? Gold. Gold tried in the fire. Okay? Fire's not fun. Fire hurts. Okay? But fire purifies. And so Job says, I know all these things I have to go through. God is making me his person. He's taking the sin and whatever dross out of my life so I come forth as gold. It's also to develop patience in your life. <clears throat> Count it all joy when these many trials come upon you. Do you? Do we count it joy? No, we usually, we usually try to get away from those things. But James says, these are the things that develop patience. To fit you for eternal life, <clears throat> uh, we are suffering in this life so we can go to another life where there is no suffering. And as a part of that, this life has some suffering. To prove that God is the strength of your life, let's take a look at that one in 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. This one has been very gripping to me over my life in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. As Paul is talking here about all the things that are happening to him, he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's the earthen vessel he's talking about here? body. So, 
Every one of us has a body, and we're living in a body. Your body is made out of dirt, okay? It's an earthen vessel. When you go to a funeral and you go to the graveside, they say dust to dust, right? God made Adam out of dust, and your body's going back to dust. But the treasure, this treasure, is inside of what? Your physical body. Your physical body is an earthen vessel. It's very fragile. It doesn't like pain. It doesn't like cold. It doesn't like hot. It likes comfortable. Okay. But you have that treasure. The treasure of your life, the treasure of your ministry, is in a, is in a clay pot. My grandma had geraniums. Anybody's grandma have geraniums? And big, big farmhouse windowsills, you know. In, in the fall of the year, I'd help my grandma dig out the geraniums, and she had these stacks of clay pots. You know what I mean? Those, I should bring one along. Those, those orange bird pots, you drop it on the sidewalk, and what happens? <laughs> they don't bounce, right? Okay. <laughs> you drop them once, and they're done. That's what I think about when I read this passage. And, and then she'd have me put these, and they were heavy, and they were full of dirt. And I was a little boy, up the steps and up the steps, and... But as I think about it in those experiences, I think about the way this body is a clay pot. And we're so fragile. We think we're tough, right? But we're not. We're fragile. But it's in this clay pot, it's in this earthen vessel, that God has placed our ministry. He's placed our life. He's placed our eternal life in there. And it's this clay pot that goes through life. And so Paul says we have this treasure everything God's given us in earthen vessels so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So if you drop a pot like that on the, on the sidewalk and it does not break, what? That would get your attention. So when you go through life and there's so many struggles, but God doesn't let you break because he's in there. Because he's, he's in here. And we have all kinds of bumps and cracks and chips. But we don't, but he doesn't allow us to break. Okay. We get pretty close sometimes. The treasure. Why is the treasure in the clay pot? Well, if he'd make us so we can't break, it wouldn't prove anything. But we are breakable. But we have the power to not sin if that treasure is indeed inside of this clay pot, then this clay pot does not have to sin. This flesh does not have to sin. We're distressed on every side, yet not, excuse me, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying, okay, for which we live. Verse 11, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our, what? Mortal flesh. That's the clay pot again. Okay. And Paul, I mean, can you imagine what Paul, how he is subjected to these, to these things where he says, uh, he says, I despaired even of life. You know, I, if you look back to chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, 2 Second Corinthians chapter 1, Verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia. We were pressed out of measure. Do you ever feel pressed out of measure? I do. Above strength. There's no strength to continue. We were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired of life. Have you ever despaired of life? Most of us do somewhere along the way. And Paul did. You know, he understood this. But if you look back also in the same chapter, First Corinthians, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter one, verse three. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, and that's inside the clay pot, remember, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we all ourselves are comforted of God. So God allows suffering in our lives to prove that he is the strength, okay? To prove that he's the strength. That's why he allows it. 
to experience God's discipline in your life when uh, he says, no chastening for the present time seems joyous but grievous. That's what your parents told you, right? This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. We never did believe that, did we? Okay. Maybe when you're a parent, you'll understand it. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> but God, I don't think God enjoys seeing us go through trouble. I know he doesn't. And yet he uses that to make us come crying to him. So you can identify with those who suffer. We just read some of this. So we can identify with those who suffer. If you suffer, it opens your heart to people who hurt. Otherwise, you'd hardly know. So the question is, is, this so we can identi- is suffering so we can identify with Christ or so Christ can identify with us? Okay, I think it's both. Let's take a look at the passages. First of all, Hebrews 4.15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's talking about Jesus. He was tempted in all points like as we are, and it means tested and all the things he had to go through. So because of that, he can identify with us. Now if you look at chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, uh, For though he were a son, talking of Jesus, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And in chapter 2 of Hebrews uh, 10 and 11, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory, that's, that's you, to make the captain of their salvation, that's Jesus, perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifies and they that sanctified are all one, for to which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So when we suffer, we can understand and identify with the captain of our salvation. Okay, read that one again. Verse 10 of chapter 2 of Hebrews, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And so as we suffer, we then identify with the God who does. Okay, I think I'd like for you to turn to uh, Psalm chapter 4, or excuse me, Psalms isn't, four, isn't chapters, Psalms or Psalms, so it's Psalm 4. Uh, Psalm 4, take a look at this. Uh, this passage gripped my life some years ago. I was struggling about what I can't even remember anymore, but uh, sometimes when I get to those places in life, I think it was 2 o'clock in the morning and I still hadn't slept, and I, I decided there's got to be an answer. I took my Bible out to the living room, turned on a little light, and started reading. I somehow God directed me to read Psalms, and I started reading in Psalm 1, 2, and I decided to read till I got the answer from God, or what I should do. And when I got to Psalm 4, I read words like this. So we're in document, uh, we're, we're moving ahead to document 18, I think it is, it's called Stand in Awe and Do Not Sin. But we're going to first of all be reading Psalm 4, and let's listen closely from, from Psalm 4. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. What's David's experience right now? In distress. He's in distress. Have you ever been in distress? Okay, I was in distress. You have enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O you sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing, which means to tell lies? But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. And then verse 4 is the verse that got my attention mostly. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Stand in awe and don't sin. Those are your options. Not always easy. We'll come back to that verse. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. 
And notice the way he starts changing in this psalm. As he prays, he knows God will hear him. He stands in awe. He doesn't sin. Uh, he puts his trust in God. And then the Lord is going to lift up the light of his countenance upon him. And in verse 7, Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and wine increased. We all like, as farmers, we like good crops. Business people like prosperous years. But can God put more joy in your heart than even a good crop? That's what he's saying here. We like good crops. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the time that corn and wine increase. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, O Lord, only makes me dwell in safety. Those are comforting words. I went back to bed and slept. But I never got quite away from Psalm 4, especially verse 4. Let's go back and look at verse 4. Here's the way I understand it. The way I understand verse 4 is that it works like this. As you're going through life, and we're agreeing here that David is in distress. Is that right? The first verse, he's in distress. So when he gets, when he gets to this place of distress, and I'm saying, as I'm applying this to the class, that there's a point of pain that we get to in life, and, and it's a point of temptation, it's a point of distress, point of problems, that we have two options. And one option is to turn toward God and stand in awe. The other option is to sin. And now if you'll take a look at your notes, the diagram of stand in awe and do not sin. Notice that many things can cause that pain and distress. It can be abuse, it can be a family member, it can be a neighbor, it can be a friend, it can be a spouse. It can be emotional, physical, sexual, it can be neglect, it can be rejection. It could be pages of things, okay? When we get there and we have this pain and distress, what I'm saying is it brings you to a place where you have to make a choice. And in that choice, you can stand in awe of God or you can sin. It's so easy to sin because the sin is a coping mechanism that allows us to fix our problem. So you have this distress, what do you do? You can turn to drugs, alcohol, pornography. You can turn to almost anything, gambling, even shopping, even working. Anything that takes you away from dealing with what God's doing in your life. The lies the devil tells you, it can be power. You can say, well, I'm in charge here, and you're going to do everything the way I do it because you're not willing to deal with the problem, you're not willing to deal with the distress, you're just gonna put the hammer down and everybody's gonna do it your way. Could be control, could be money, you get lost in your business, in your farm, in whatever you're doing, get lost in yourself. Those t coping mechanisms are sinful self-medications. It's a way I can fix the problem right now. And you'll feel better. If you get drunk, you'll feel better for a little bit, right? Unfortunately, the little bit gets, gets all, and you come back to more pain. And so what happens is that sinful self-medication becomes self-abuse. And it sets up an addictive cycle of deepening sinful behavior, where the self becomes the abuser, the medication is the abuse, the result is spiritual blindness. And if we continually turn in that direction, we continually turn in the sin direction, it takes us into something that brings us back here again, and after a while, we get in a cycle, and we don't know how to get out. Okay. And here's what I like to, we'll, we'll spend more time on this as we go along, but here's what I like to think about. You're walking through the woods. Did you ever walk through the woods on a path, and you say, oh, I think there was once a path over here. You ever see that? Or weeds are there, little trees are there, but you can recognize there was once a path. Why are the, why are the weeds and the trees growing up there? Why? 
Okay, it wasn't maintained. Nobody's been using that for a while, right? So it's grown up. Here's how it works. The path that's going to look like the path is the path that you're going to wear. If you're wearing this path, every time you get to a point of pain and distress in your life, which path will you take? Because if you don't use this one, this one's going to grow up with weeds. Right? So if we can see that even though it hurts, we can take the path toward God, what's going to happen to this path? If we begin taking the path toward God, what will happen to the other path? The other one's going to start growing over, right? And if we do that, eventually, this is going to start growing weeds and little trees, okay? And it won't look like the path anymore. It won't happen in one day. It won't happen in a week. But you know, when you start using this path, you'll start wearing out those bushes and briars. And you might need some help. Many times people need help the first couple times through there. You might need somebody with a chainsaw or an axe. You with me? You might need a weed eater, okay? You might need a bush hog, right? But after a while, this can start looking like the path. So when I get here, and I allowed this one to grow over because I stopped doing those things, even though I know this is going to hurt, I'll start taking that path. And I stand in awe of God, and I say, God, I don't know why, but I'm here. Whatever you want to do to me, I'm here. And let the pain happen. Let the pain happen. Don't fix it with sin, okay? You understand what I'm saying? Don't fix that with some kind of sin. Don't go off and read a romance novel because it's fun, okay? Don't let that happen. You've got to make a conscious decision. Turn toward God. And allow whatever the pain is to happen. Find somebody close to be with. Okay? <coughs> somebody to help you to walk through this. It's been a, a huge blessing in my life to live this way, to think that way, to see how that when I turn toward God, I allow the pain of healing to happen. It will hurt. It'll hurt. It will hurt. Sometimes it hurts a long time. But you know, we talked about a dentist drooling out your cavities, right? Could hurt. But there will be healing, right? So as we get to this point in life, turn toward God. Find the defense mechanisms that you're using. Find the painful self-medications that you're using in your life and realize that they are going to put you in, in a cycle, okay? They're going to put you in that cycle. And when we get in that cycle, it just becomes so hard to get out. But notice that in Psalm 4, David goes from distress to sleep. He goes from distress to rest. He goes from distress, recognizing that God will hear, knowing that God's there, and knowing that God cares enough to, to give you rest. Okay. Did I say it was going to be easy? No. Not easy. And we need to walk with each other on that journey. Okay. Desperately need each other on that journey. I meet people. I work with people. And if you look at the top of your page there, you see when we allow the pain of healing to happen, we stand in awe, we start breaking the sin cycles. I have a good friend who, who tells me he's got four children growing up. His father left their family when he was just a boy. He said, Frank, I'm going to break that cycle of sin. Sometimes we have to have that level of determination. He said, I'm, I'm going to break that cycle of sin. I'm not going to do what my dad did. With all respect to my dad, I'm not going to do that. You can break sin cycles. You can do it. Learning. Learning what God has to teach you. Turn to music. 
music has been a huge asset in my life, you know. Just think of, of uh, I owe the Lord a morning song. That's been going through my mind. And uh, the way, now may thy spirit as the light direct me in this way. I believe that. You know, when the devil's trying to put thoughts in your mind that are bad and destructive, start singing, okay? That's a command from the Bible. Get those good words, that good truth into your mind. Get rid of that trash that's up there trying to destroy you. The Bible, God, chastening. You know, if you want to be good at doing almost anything, you're going to have to work at it. And that chasing and discipline is part of life. And when we do that, there's peace, there's gladness, there's growth, there's strength, there's healing and worship. So in the closing minutes here, I would like you to turn in your Bible to Jeremiah 2.13, and then to John 7, and then we'll discontinue for today. In Jeremiah 2.13, Jeremiah says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they've hewed out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. You know what? You know what this cycle is? It's broken cisterns. Jesus will quote this in John 7. I'm in John 7, verse 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. NIV says, out of your innermost being. Where does that come from? That's your innermost being. Okay. And the, nurse, the next verse says, but this spoke he of what? The Spirit. That they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. But, but he said, I'm going to give you the Spirit. And that spirit is going to be a well of water springing up inside of you. 